Welcome to the video, a constructionist map of the psyche. Constructionist fluidity meets the Apollonian unconscious. My name is Dr. Stephen Bacon. I'm a clinical psychologist in Santa Barbara, California, and I've spent the past decade writing books and researching exactly how psychotherapy works. The constructionist map of mind. In this video, we will offer a constructionist model of mind. Personal growth, which is the objective of these videos, involves changing parts of the mind. To date, we have been discussing constructionism from a philosophic and psychological perspective and have emphasized deconstructing different assumptions and paradigms that limit change. In this video, we are going to examine the effects of the constructionist perspective on different parts of the mind. More specifically, we're going to look at the initial effects of constructionism on the conscious mind and begin to explore how the conscious interacts with various forms of the unconscious. The Apollonian unconscious. The unconscious mind is primarily Apollonian. That is, in addition to its functions that support safety and survival, it essentially supports stability and continuity. In this sense, most of the unconscious is an obstacle to change. By unconscious, we are not referring simply to the part of the mind made famous by Freud. Rather, we are talking about the fact that the vast majority of our behaviors and decisions are influenced by, and often controlled by, the part of our mind-body outside of conscious control. Many psychologists, philosophers, and neuroscientists have pointed out that it is an illusion to believe that our conscious mind is fully, or even mostly, in control of our life. We're going to explore some concepts made famous by two of them, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt and neuroscientist David Eagleman. The automatic mind. The unconscious mind is not one thing. Rather, it is a collection of different unconscious minds, each making a certain contribution. We will begin by looking at the automatic unconscious. The presence and power of the automatic mind is perhaps most easily illustrated by driving. Most drivers regularly have the experience of driving across town and not being able to remember anything about the journey. They know, of course, that if something unusual comes up, the automatic mind will alert the conscious mind and full attention will return to the driving. More entertaining examples abound. For example, Eagleman points out that if one examines all the first names of married people, there is a small but significant effect, 5% greater than chance, that the married people's first names start with the same letter. For example, Sam Mary Susan. Another famous experiment has to do with males rating pictures of females. If the pictures are doctored so that the eyes are dilated by two millimeters, the attractiveness score is much higher. Of course, dilated eyes signify attention and attraction. Bias and the automatic mind. Of course, no one is consciously using a strategy of only dating someone with the same first initial, but the automatic mind feels slightly more comfortable when that occurs, hence the statistical effect. And obviously, the men were consciously unaware of the manipulation of the diameter of the pupils, but the automatic mind was aware and responded accordingly. Another famous example is the implicit bias test. This test can operate in different ways, but essentially it measures your reaction time to positive and negative words when paired with various cues, such as black versus white people or thin versus overweight. A person might deny any racism or fat bias, but these tests demonstrate that the automatic mind has far more biases than one might imagine. Such examples are everywhere. What becomes potentially alarming is when one recognizes that certain feelings of comfort, discomfort, intuition, uneasiness, and attraction are barraging us throughout the day, entirely outside of conscious control. Body and biochemistry, the physical unconscious. We are all aware of just how much our bodies influence our choices and our feelings. The simplest example is the way that poor sleep casts a tired, irritable pall over our whole day. Interesting research has looked at the adrenal functioning of conservatives versus liberals. To oversimplify to make a point, conservatives tend to be relatively more prone to an epinephrine 
flight or fight response than liberals. This implies that conservatives live in a different biochemical reality than liberals, where they literally have more gut feelings about the presence of threatening stimuli. One can offer arguments to a conservative about the relative safety of the world or the healing possibilities of following John Lennon's advice that love is all there is. However, when one's gut is signaling the presence of danger, threat, such arguments ring hollow. Stress, body armor, and ill health. Pretty much all mental health issues affect the body and vice versa. The conglomeration of poor sleep, poor eating patterns, poor exercise, the presence of disease, increases in pain and gastrointestinal distress, all lead to the feeling of a life out of balance and off center. Another important factor is what Wilhelm Reich called character or body armor. He hypothesized that each person responds to experience, particularly trauma, with factors like muscular spasms, decreased mobility, and postural misalignments. These problems remain in the body long after the experiences that cause them and operate as filters that affect our daily feelings and cognitions. Many therapists argue that clients cannot improve if they have a substance abuse disorder, and they certainly have a point. However, most therapists and most personal growth seekers consistently underestimate just how powerfully the body and the biochemistry can affect the mind. It's difficult to think well when one's body is moving in a counterproductive direction. The genetic unconscious. The latest research in behavioral genetics has enormous implications for personal growth. On average, geneticists estimate that genetic proclivities account for approximately 50% of the variation in behavioral variables, like happiness, grit, depression, and reality orientation. Of course, it should be emphasized that these are tendencies and aware individuals can institute a variety of personal interventions to moderate negative genetic effects and strengthen positive ones. But it is still important to understand that all of our feelings and cognitions are unconsciously influenced by our genetic tendencies. The affective unconscious. The affective unconscious is the most famous part of the unconscious mind. It stores emotions and memories and has unfortunately earned the reputation of sending unwanted feelings of fear, anger, anxiety, and attraction at just the wrong time with occasional devastating results. Recall that Kahneman argued that evolution favors emphasizing fear and avoidance to maximize survival. Hence, it should not surprise us to discover that the unconscious is highly motivated in terms of avoiding experiences that might lead to physical or social injury or death. This unconscious is adept at linking one experience to another so that a current failure can often make us feel the brunt of many previous failures. It can increase its sensitivity so we get more and more easily triggered by external events. For example, agoraphobia is often progressive with a person beginning by avoiding a few things. Eventually, however, they might become so frightened of so many things that they are literally incapable of leaving the home. Perhaps most importantly, it can send a sufficient amount of negative affect that one becomes convinced that they are a broken or flawed person. The relational self and the transactional unconscious. This unconscious part is one of the harder ones to describe and understand. Many social constructionists believe that it is more accurate to conceive of the self as living in the dialectic space between myself and the other, instead of visualizing it as something that has a stable internal existence. They argue that we have as many selves as we have relationships, and that these selves are often significantly different from each other, with varying strengths and weaknesses, and even dissimilar priorities and strategies. A simple example might be a woman who was quite retiring and subassertive before she had children and is still that way when it comes to protecting herself. However, in the context of advocating for her children in the role of mother, she is both assertive and outspoken. This assertive ability does not appear to arise from personal growth work or conscious development. Rather, it seems to come out fully formed with little or no preparation. Where were these assertive abilities prior to becoming a mother? And why are they still unavailable to the main personality? 
Transactions. We all know that we live suspended in a complex social matrix that responds to our behaviors and words with various rewards and punishments. This transactional matrix actually acts as another form of the unconscious, with individuals implicitly calculating the results of their interactions and experiencing appropriate feelings and cognitions as a result. An example might be a spouse who continues to cultivate feelings of love for a wealthy partner, even though they are receiving a daily diet of abuse. It is helpful to understand that individuals who are responding to transactional calculations often report that their feelings seem valid and authentic to themselves, and that from their perspective, they are unrelated to punishments rewards. In the example above, the spouse might deny that the wealth had anything to do with their ability to sustain love in the face of ongoing abuse. In some cases, this denial might be conscious and manipulative. However, in many cases, the protagonist is literally unconscious about the transactional processes. Transactional denial. Another common example might be the behavior of a husband when a wife forces him to vacation in Hawaii when he actually wants to have a ski vacation. During the entire Hawaii vacation, he complains about one thing or another, the traffic, the weather, the accommodations. The wife accuses him of pouting, of punishing her for forcing the Hawaii vacation. The husband assures her he would never do that and that his responses on vacation are to the actual experiences, not a transaction with her for winning the vacation argument. Many people remain completely unconscious of just how many of their feelings and behaviors are transactions, as opposed to independent responses to one's environment. The collective unconscious and intuition. Many philosophers and psychologists have argued for the existence of a part of the unconscious that is somehow aligned with ways of knowing and connecting that are hard to explain with a pragmatic model of mind. Intuition, extrasensory perceptions, profoundly empathic experiences, and shared archetypes are examples of this part of the unconscious functioning. While the existence of this part of the unconscious continues to be the source of much debate, many therapists and growth seekers see this aspect of the unconscious as a source of change, innovation, creativity, and a kind of deep ecology sort of connection. While other parts of the unconscious are clearly biased toward the Apollonian, this part of the unconscious is strikingly Dionysian and is often touted as an ally for change and growth. Evolution, the unconscious, and positive bias. It's not hard to figure out that all of these forms of the unconscious mind were designed by evolution and have an underlying purpose of ensuring our own survival. That said, it's also not hard to figure out that the interaction of these various forms of the unconscious, in combination with the environment and other people, can put an individual in quite a bind, especially given that different parts of the mind can pull a person in quite different directions. It is some comfort to know that all these parts were designed to help us. In fact, many therapists emphasize that each of these parts has an underlying positive intention in spite of how many uncomfortable symptoms they may cause in the present moment. That's often the problem. A solution at one period in a person's life becomes a problem when applied at a different period. The Rider and the Elephant Jonathan Haidt uses the metaphor of the elephant and the rider to describe the whole mind. The conscious mind is the rider, and the different unconscious minds make up the elephant. Collectively, the elephant is much more powerful than the rider, although the rider has the capacity to steer and influence the elephant if it does so skillfully. The elephant is fundamentally Apollonian in that the different unconscious minds tend to resist change and stabilize identity. The conscious mind has the capacity to be Dionysian, to visualize change and to influence the various parts of the elephant to change. Because of the capacity of the conscious mind to be Dionysian, and because the overt thrust of constructionism is in the area of paradigms and models, aligning the conscious mind with constructionist principles is the first goal of this type of personal growth. Constructionism and the conscious mind. Having a clean conscious mind that is able to utilize the constructionist principles is often easier said than done. Our old metaphor of the freedom of the enlightened exorcist 
is easy to appreciate in theory, but harder to accomplish in practice. The conscious mind is subjected to so many influences, our cultural programming, the effects of each part of the unconscious, and the inner actions and transactions of those around us. Each of these creates a strand of meaning and identity, strands that bind us into our current Apollonian identity. Deconstruction is the process of identifying those strands and loosening their bonds. If we can achieve a conscious mind relatively free from these bonds, it becomes an excellent platform, a functional place to stand to influence the unconscious. Discernment and Dissociation For the conscious mind to embrace and utilize the benefits of constructionism, it needs to resist the onslaughts, both from the external culture and the internal parts of the elephant. Freedom from those two factors requires intimate familiarity with the two D words, discernment and dissociation. I can see or discern the way that the culture continuously attempts to influence me. The influence is primarily Apollonian and operates to stabilize my identity. Recognizing and resisting this process is discernment. And I am required to practice dissociation when I examine and try to understand the different aspects of my unconscious. One way or another, they are all attempting to convince me that I am limited by my past traumas, my biochemistry, and my genetics proclivities. Identification with these parts and their messages tends to create confusion, self-deprecation, and pain. Cultivating another perspective. Discernment is easy to describe but hard to practice. Become aware of the cultural programming and what it says about change and growth. For example, change is hard and requires persistence and sustained effort. Trauma and bad childhood experiences limit my life potential. I'm not a normie and will never be one. I need to master new skills to handle my life. Discerning between what is true about change and what is simply Apollonian programming allows one to discard, deconstruct unhelpful concepts. Another simple but powerful approach is to attempt to see all cultural programming and assumptions from the perspective of another culture. If Western ideas about change are true, they will be true in another culture. For example, all four of the sentences above about change would make no sense in a culture that believes that mental health problems occur secondary to the absence of a spiritual substance like mana. Dissociation. Clearly, the writer has the ability to influence and reprogram the various parts of the unconscious. It is just as clear that the elephant has the power to markedly influence the writer. Whenever we identify with the feelings and concepts arising from the unconscious, it gives them more power and influence. Dissociation is the process of seeing the unconscious as other. From this perspective, we can witness the operations of the various parts of the unconscious without being possessed by them. Common sense tells us the most difficult areas for dissociation are connected with shame and guilt and the ensuing label of self as bad, broken, and unredeemable. When we identify with these feelings and messages from the unconscious, the conscious mind becomes so confused it no longer functions as a platform for change. Instead, the conscious mind becomes part of the problem not part of the solution. Shame, guilt, and worldviews. There's a famous psychodynamic saying, no one gets through childhood unscathed. Similarly, no one is initiated into a cultural worldview without absorbing a significant amount of shame and guilt. Cultural worldviews are variable and arbitrary. Given this arbitrariness, there is no internal instinct that guides us to see the world accurately. Because we cannot say, just trust what you feel, we are forced to teach children to see the world the right way by correcting them when they choose to see reality and identity the wrong way. This process is intimately connected to shame and guilt. An obvious and current example has to do with gender roles and the parental choices around instructing children about everything from boys play with trucks and guns to girls like makeup and rehearsing weddings and so on. Even parents who choose not to shame certain behaviors are aware that as their children operate in the general culture, they will be victims of significant shaming and guilt from others if they deviate from accepted gender roles. 
Shared worldviews, while necessary to create functional cultures, come at a price. Shame as an Apollonian construct. Shame, of course, is one of the Apollonian's strongest tools. Apollonians know what is right and what is wrong, and what to do with those who violate the norms. From this point of view, shame and guilt are inevitable feelings that are byproducts of forming constructed realities. In that sense, they are entirely normal. While all therapists are united in recommending against cultivating excessive shame, it is a mistake to imagine that children can be raised without shame and guilt, or that adults can be entirely free from these factors. This leads directly to the second tool that complements dissociation. Normalization. When shame and guilt are appropriately normalized, these feelings lose much of their power to do mischief. Apollonian influences are omnipresent. Shame and guilt are omnipresent and a necessary part of worldview formation. Certainly they should be recognized as constructs, constructs that are no more real than the worldviews they support. This recognition, especially when practiced with a light touch, is one of the best secrets to working effectively with them. The Centered Conscious Mind There is an old joke in psychology which asks, how many psychologists are needed to change a light bulb? Answer. One, but the light bulb has to want a change. This joke highlights the fact that most psychotherapy and personal growth systems work best when the conscious mind is motivated and committed to change. In terms of achieving this desirable state, the constructionist approach is superior to the standard one. First, the standard approach fails to deconstruct all of the implicit Apollonian assumptions that contribute to stability and limit the change process. Second, those who practice deconstruction are particularly well-suited to practice dissociation. Deconstruction requires disidentification. This begins in the world of ideas and concepts. Dissociation takes the same approach, but applies it to the world of feelings and intuitions. Deconstruction is particularly active in the area of self. Constructionism is always focused on removing Apollonian limits on identity. Applying the same strategy to dissociation from the feelings generated by the unconscious is relatively natural and easy. The Constructionist Edge Third, constructionism endorses a much more profound sense of the fluidity of reality than the standard view. Virtually all of these videos have argued that cultures are required to support the Apollonian in order to function effectively and predictably. Constructionism challenges all of these Apollonian models and replaces them with the Dionysian sense that everything is fluid and the nature of life is change and adaptation. The conscious mind that has embraced the twin practices of discernment and dissociation has a significant edge over the standard approach. It is relatively free of the Apollonian assumptions about stability and the difficulty of change. It disidentifies with the unconscious ideas and feelings, and it is profoundly more open to seeing reality and the psyche as fluid and malleable. Know better. Maya Angelou famously said, when you know better, do better. This phrase could be adopted as the motto of constructionism. Constructionism allows us to know better and then standing in that knowledge to do better Do better in terms of regulating the elephant and do better in terms of the freedom to live life aligned with our personal vision. No better also includes the map of the psyche and the culture implicit in this and preceding videos. Having the map lets us know where to make certain interventions and how to deal with certain challenges and opportunities. Finally, Christians have often used the phrase, be in the world but not of the world. From a constructionist perspective, this idea suggests that the awakened constructionist continues to be a part of the world, but is relatively untouched by the pervasive Apollonian programming. But it can be hard. All this optimism about change is appropriate, but we are all aware that a number of personal growth seekers sometimes feel as if they have hit a wall in their quest. More specifically, Even though they may grasp the essential points of the constructionist argument, the hopefulness and promise of that paradigm 
are diffused and discounted by their own gut feelings, that somehow there is something deeply wrong with them, something that is highly resistant to change. These so-called gut feelings are simply the result of inadequate discernment and dissociation. However, pointing this out is not sufficient in terms of altering these gut feelings. Such reactions are not unusual. They stop the positive power of constructionism in their tracks. They need a set of practices, most of which operate in fundamental reality, to access the full benefits of dissociation. These practices are described in the next video.